everyone is anyway. <laughs> And I should just say that you probably just saw a sign pop up saying this meeting is being recorded, which it is. Um, good evening. My name is Catherine Hellerstein, and um, I am, I just managed to minimize my screen. Um, I'm the Ruth Meltzer Director of the Jewish Studies Program at Penn and Professor of Yiddish in the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures. On behalf of the University of Pennsylvania and the faculty of the Jewish Studies Program, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 35th annual Joseph Alexander Colloquium. The Joseph Alexander Colloquium is the Jewish Studies Program's oldest endowed lectureship. Over the past 35 years, it has become one of our real institutions, an intellectual touchstone and highlight of the Jewish Studies academic year. This year, due to the pandemic, for the first time, we are holding the Alexander Colloquium on Zoom rather than on Penn's campus. And honestly, I hope this is the last time. We can only hope that Hashanah Haba'a next year, we will be able to convene again in person. The colloquium was established through the generosity of the Joseph Alexander Foundation and the Mackler family, specifically by the late Helen and Alfred Mackler in memory of their brother and uncle. The Macklers are longstanding loyal friends of the university who have been among the staunchest supporters of the Jewish studies program since its inception. And I'm especially happy to be able to welcome on the Zoom call Harvey Mackler and Andy Mackler Windheim and other members of their family. All of us in the Jewish Studies program very much appreciate the opportunity that the Mackler family has given us to join together to explore issues and share ideas on how important Jewish topics, on important Jewish topics within a scholarly forum for the benefit of the Jewish Studies faculty and students for the benefit of the university community and of the larger Philadelphia community and now of the larger American community and possibly beyond while we're on Zoom. I wanna thank Chrissy Walsh, Administrative Coordinator for the Jewish Studies Program and Chris, um, the IT person on board here for hosting and managing the Zoom format of this talk. Over the past three and a half decades, the Joseph Alexander Colloquium has brought many distinguished speakers to Penn, including political scientists, scholars of Yiddish and Hebrew literature and culture, both medieval and modern, historians and ethnomusicologists who revived Klezmer, and now a food studies expert and Russian scholar. The, 35, the 35th colloquium speaker in, continues this distinguished line of Jewish scholars, of not necessarily Jewish, of scholars on Jewish culture and history. Dara Goldstein, the Wilcox B. and Harriet M. Astit Professor of Russian Emerita at Williams College, and the founding editor of Gastronomica, the Journal of Food and Culture, served as lead scholar for the YIVO online learning course, A Seat at the Table, A Journey into Jewish Food. She is consultant for the Council of Europe and is currently series editor of the California Studies in Food and Culture series at the University of California Press. She has been distinguished fellow in food studies at the University of Toronto, and held the McGeorge Fellowship at the University of Melbourne. Goldstein sits on the advisory board of the Julia Child Foundation for Gast Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts and is a member of the advisory kitchen cabinet for the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. A scholar and master teacher of literature and culture Dara Goldstein has written or edited some 17 books. Among them are numerous cookbooks she's authored, 
including the Georgian Feast, which won the 1994 Julia Child Award for Cookbook of the Year, and Fire and Ice, Classic Nordic Cooking, as well as the Oxford Companion to, for, to Sugar and Sweets, both of which were finalists for the James Beard Foundation Award. The journal she founded and edited, Gastronomica, was awarded the James Beard Foundation Publication of the Year in 2012. Professor Goldstein's latest book is a gorgeous volume that takes the reader far beyond and far above the Arctic Circle, beyond the North Wind, Russia in recipes and lore. As a dear friend since our graduate school days and a lifelong fan, I have held many of Dara's cookbooks on my kitchen shelf and I use them. I can attest that Beyond the North Wind shares with all of her other cookbooks the splendid qualities of beautiful illustrations, intriguing stories, cultural insights, and fantastic user-friendly recipes that produce unusual and delicious dishes. You don't have to be a master chef to love and use Dara Goldstein's cookbooks. Please join me in extending the warmest of welcomes to Professor Dara Goldstein. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, it's thrilling for me to be here tonight. And thank you to Penn, to Chrissy and Chris for your help with this technology. And we're just having fingers crossed that everything will go well tonight because we're having a little bit of issue with uh, our power tonight here in Williamstown. So with luck, it will all go well. I am going to talk to you about Ashkenazi food in America. And I thought that since I can't be with you in person, rather than having you stare at my face for 45 minutes, I would show a slideshow that you have some beautiful images to look at as I'm talking. So I'm going to share my screen now. And um, I'm hoping that you all can see that. Is that good? Okay. Yes. So we will begin. The Ashkenazi Kitchen in America. And what you see here is the holy trinity of Jewish food. Bagels, cream cheese, and lox. And I chose this image because all of the individual elements of it really tell a larger story about Jewish food in America. Now, uh, the Jews have been uh, spread throughout the world in the diaspora. And wherever they go, in terms of their kitchen, it's a process of adaptation and assimilation. And the story is the same here in the US, but it's a little bit different here because not only has Jewish food in many ways become mainstream, as we'll discuss a bit later, but also American corporate culture has infiltrated the Jewish kitchen. So when we talk about, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm on my husband's computer because of these issues and it is not um, behaving like mine, but now it's all good. So uh, some of the iconic foods that uh, have come into American culinary life are the bagels, lox, and cream cheese, kosher dills. Uh, these happen to be half sours, which are my favorite, which are only fermented for a few days. The fish in their commercial form from Manischewitz, which are either uh, something you adore or something you disdain. And I don't think that there is a middle ground between it. And rugelach, I happened to make these a few days ago, uh, thinking about this talk. And these are pastries, very tender, flaky pastries that are made with none other than Philadelphia cream cheese. So not just these foods, but also chopped liver has become so much a part of American culture that it is also a meme these days. What am I, chopped liver? Well, what uh, are Ashkenazi Jews? 
Uh, forgive me for those of you who are very steeped in Jewish culture, but I think that there may be some people who aren't quite as familiar with it. Um, broadly stated, there are two major groups of Jews, the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim. The Ashkenazim come from Central and Eastern Europe. And Sephardic Jews are from the Mediterranean, from the Middle East, from North Africa. And their cuisine, as you might expect, uh, reflects that flavor profile. And we're going to focus on the foods of um, Eastern Europe and a bit of Central Europe. And the reason for this is because the major immigration into the United States came from this part of the world. In the 19th century, Jews were forced to live in what was called the Pale of Settlement. And very few of them were allowed to live outside of that. And you can see a map here. Um, it, it encompassed much of Russia, Western Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania. Uh, down here you can see Bessarabia, which is uh, what is now Moldova. And beginning in the mid 19th century, Jews from the German-speaking parts of Europe, from Germany and Aust Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire, began emigrating to the United States. And uh, they landed in New York, but a lot of them continued going west. And it was actually Cincinnati that became the center of Jewish life of this early immigration. They went even beyond that. I remember when I met Catherine in graduate school, she told me that her grandparents had lived in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I hadn't realized that Jews lived in Lincoln, Nebraska. You know, I was so East Coast centric. They went even further. Think about Levi Strauss who went to San Francisco and uh, started making denim jeans for the gold rush miners. So they spread out through the United States. The emigration that interests us a bit more though in terms of cuisine began in 1880 and continued until 1924. And this was a mass immigration of Jews from the Pale of Settlement. And over the course of those 40 some years, 2.8 million Jews arrived and mainly stayed in New York City. Obviously some went elsewhere, but New York City became the locus particularly the Lower East Side. And in a one square mile radius, there were something like 500,000 Jews. And so their life and their food really came to define Jewish food in America. Well, the German Jews who were already here and were very well established supposedly met their poor brethren, brethren, the huddled masses, with open arms, as you see in this print from the Library of Congress. But very tellingly, there is this sea between them, and there was indeed a big rift. The German Jews had tended to be more educated, more affluent, and uh, they were a little bit dismayed at not only how poor the Jews from Eastern Europe were, but they also tended to be less educated. Uh, they had a diet that was very much based in pickled foods, uh, pickled herring, all kinds of pickles, uh, smoked fish, and not too many fruits and vegetables. And they took it upon themselves to educate and ra raise up these Jews. Uh, so that they could become more assimilated into American culture. Well, what did that look like? As you can see in this photograph, these Eastern Euro in this uh, print, these Eastern European Jews arrived with not very much. They weren't allowed to take much. But the one thing that all of them brought, if they possibly could, was their most prized possession, which was a brass samovar. This was a fixture in Russian Jewish life, also in Ukraine. And it's basically an urn for heating hot water. You have hot coals or twigs in this uh, central chamber. It heats the water. And then the hot water comes from this spigot and you can have a strong brew of tea that you can uh, 
add as much water to make it weak or medium or strong. So even though they were living in very squalid conditions in the Lower East Side, this was a point of pride. And for those of you who are in Philadelphia, there's a beautiful samovar in the National Museum of, um, of um, American Jews in downtown Philadelphia that uh, you can look at. Well, there's a wonderful writer from the early part of the 20th century, Anzia Yazerska, who herself was a very poor immigrant. She came as a child and she was living on the Lower East Side and really struggling until she managed to write these short stories. This collection was published in uh, 1922 and she ended up going to Hollywood and uh, she really raised herself above the masses. But one of my favorite stories is one called The Lost Beautifulness that begins with, oy vey, how it shines the beautifulness exalted Hanachaya over her newly painted kitchen. So Hanachaya had been working for a, a Christian woman uh, doing her laundry and things like that. And this woman had a beautiful shining white kitchen with white walls. And Hanachaya wanted her kitchen to be as beautiful for when her son came back from the army. So she scrimped and saved and she managed to slowly get enough money for paint. It was oil-based paint, so you can imagine what it smelled like in that tenement kitchen. And she managed to paint it and it was her pride and it was her joy and her son was coming home. But in a uh, turn of cruel irony, in this story, her landlord sees that the kitchen is now beautiful and realizes he can get more money for it and evicts her. And her son comes back from the army and finds her out on the street. So it's really, her stories are really quite heartbreaking. The reality of the kitchen was such that not just cooking went on there, but it was really like a sweatshop of the Jews had to do their uh, labors in the kitchen and uh, they had a kitchen and maybe one other room if they were lucky. And here you can see them sewing um, and making lace, which was a typical occupation for many of the newly arrived Eastern European Jews. The German Jews felt that um, these conditions were very unsanitary, unhygienic, as of course they were. And there were all kinds of movements to improve their life. And uh, this dates from 1903. It's a photograph of a model tenement kitchen. And the idea was that these new tenement apartments would be built and people could move into them. And very importantly, the kitchen is on a large open court, which admits plenty of light and air. So it was all about good hygiene. And of course, here you see a mirror, uh, which also would reflect light. And the whole idea is that it would be bright and not gloomy. Uh, this photograph really kills me because there is no, no sign of a woman and her labors and cooking. Instead, you have this very well-fed, well-dressed man sitting and leisurely reading his newspaper. Um, the German Jews created all kinds of charitable organizations to help their newly arrived brethren. And uh, one thing I should note is that unlike other immigrant groups that arrived in the late 19th century, say the Chinese or the Italians or the Irish for that matter, most of those uh, came as single young men. Uh, who worked and earned money to then later bring their families. The Jews tended to arrive as families. And so there were lots of young uh, women. There were a lot of kids. And the German Jews set up organizations like the Educational Alliance on the Lower East Side to give cooking classes. And the idea was to wean the Eastern European Jews from their unhealthy diet and inculcate in them a love of the bland American diet, which tended towards white creamy foods that uh, didn't have the reek of garlic, 
which was a marker of uh, Jewish kitchens and looked down upon by many people. And it had more uh, fruits and more fresh vegetables. They also organized uh, serving classes so that the young Jewish girls could learn etiquette and perhaps enter into the service class and in that way use food and the table as a way of lifting themselves up and becoming more up upwardly mobile. But it wasn't just through cooking, it was also through other forms of food. Um, and one thing that I think is so interesting about uh, the tensions between the German Jews who had arrived earlier and the Eastern European Jews is that uh, the arena in which many of these tensions were played out was food. So this is a very famous menu from a banquet that was held in 1883 in Cincinnati which if you remember was where many of the German American Jews lived. And uh, many of those Jews were um, part of the reform movement, which had started in Germany, but it became very active here in the United States. And basically reform Judaism was moving away from the more traditional religious strictures of Orthodox Jewry. And uh, the basis of uh, the Jewish dietary laws is something called kashrut. And there are lots of uh, nuances to it, but basically it means that um, if you're a religious Jew who follows uh, kosher laws, then you do not eat pork, you do not eat shellfish, you do not mix meat and dairy in the same meal. So this banquet came to be known as the Trefa Banquet, Treif or trefa is the Yiddish word for food that is not kosher. And it was held to uh, honor the first graduates of the Union, the Hebrew Union College. So these were the young rabbis who were being ordained. And they had this uh, banquet and it was all very fancy. As you can see, it's done in French. And uh, you have potage and boisson and everything. But you have little neck clams. You have soft shell crabs, you have shrimp salad, you have frog's legs, which are also not kosher. And in addition to beef, you have ice cream and cheese. So a mix of meat and dairy at the meal. And it caused this huge rift because uh, the Orthodox Jews were really horrified that this was the meal that was being served where many of the Reform Jews said, basically, you can still be very Jewish even if you don't follow the letter of the kosher law. And this banquet um, precipitated the founding of the uh, Union um, Theological Seminary in uh, New York City, which was the beginning of the conservative movement. So food was really very important. And it was played out in cookbooks as well. So uh, one of the most popular cookbooks appeared in 1889 and was called Aunt Babette's Cookbook. Aunt Babette was uh, a pseudonym for Bertha Kramer. And this book was so popular that it actually went through uh, 11 editions well into the 20th century. It was not kosher. There was a glossary at the back of the book in which uh, Aunt Babette defined certain Yiddish terms, one of them being trefa, which means not kosher, but basically her definition was nothing is trefa that is healthy and clean. So once again, it didn't have to do with particular foods, but it had to do with sanitation and hygiene. By contrast, we have one of the earliest cookbooks in Yiddish that was published in the United States, in 1901 by Hinda Amkranitsky, Manual on How to Cook and Bake. And unlike Aunt Babette's cookbook, it was in this sole edition. Maybe she just looks too stern and foreboding, but it was not a particularly popular cookbook. The one that was most popular of all was the settlement cookbook. And I imagine that many of you have this in your own kitchens on your shelf. 
it was first published in 1901, and it was a uh, result of these charitable organizations that the Jew German Jews had set up for their Eastern European newly arrived immigrants. This one was a settlement house in Minneapolis and uh, a woman named Lizzie Kander Black realized that the cooking classes that she was teaching there along with some of the other women in her community had really good recipes, so they decided to compile them into this charitable cookbook. And I think any of you who belong to different uh, synagogues or uh, temple communities know that charitable cookbooks are wonderful fundraisers. And the settlement cookbook was uh, one of the most successful. It has been over a hundred years since it was first published. It's still in print, now published by Simon & Schuster, and in something like its 40th edition. Well, another way having to do with food that Jews could lift themselves up was through selling it. And on the Lower East Side, it was just mass people and all kinds of uh, vibrant energy. And the Jews who were first starting out, the Eastern European ones, often had push carts. And these mobile carts could be uh, rolled throughout the streets. This one is selling kvass, which is a lightly alcoholic beverage, uh, very popular in Russia, that is made from lightly fermented black bread. And it tastes a little bit like a, a small beer. If you became a bit more successful with selling your wares, then you could have a stationary stand as you see here with pickles. And this was a great advantage because if people liked your pickles then they knew where you would always be, they didn't have to hope that you would come by on the street. Uh, they could come, they could buy the pickles. If you happen to be in the Lower East Side, I suggest that you go to Grand Street where you will find today the pickle guys who have many different kinds of pickles. But the last store remaining of many, many pickle shops um, on the Lower East Side. So if you became really successful with this, then you could have what everyone was dreaming of, and that was a brick and mortar store. And here we have Russ and Daughters, which was established in 1914. And it is very important to note that there were different kinds of shops for observant Jews who had to keep meat and milk, uh, meat and dairy separate, and also wanted to observe kosher laws. You see the word here, appetizing. That isn't an adjective. It's actually a noun. And Rust the Daughters was what was called an appetizing shop, which meant that it sold fish, uh, salted fish, cured fish like lox, smoked fish, sable fish. It also sold uh, things like uh, salads, prepared salads. And uh, people could go there and get uh, these cold dishes and take them home. In 2014, a hundred years after this was founded, Russ and Daughters opened a cafe. So I think it's really wonderful that it keeps morphing and um, finding new forms. In addition to appetizing shops, there were dairy restaurants, most famous of which was arguably Ratner's. Uh, the only one really that's left on the Lower East Side today is uh, B&H Dairy. Ratner's was really beloved. It was founded in uh, 1905, but closed in 2014. And here you could have wonderful dairy foods in a restaurant setting, things like blintzes, as you see at the bottom, which are crepes that are filled with a fresh farmer's cheese. You could get mama liga, which is uh, beloved by Romanian Jews. It is like polenta. You could have kasha varnishkas, which are buckwheat broths, and in their American incarnation, they're mixed with onions and with bow tie noodles, and all kinds of dishes with sour cream. So it was a really uh, wonderful place where people could gather 
and have these dairy foods. But by far the most uh, iconic, I guess you would say, and the most beloved were the delicatessens. Originally, these were kosher butcher shops that sold meat and uh, kosher cuts of meat and uh, particularly cured meats like corned beef or pastrami. And many of them then turned into delicatessens where you could sit and have a meal. The uh, late lamented Carnegie delicatessen closed at the end of 2016, um, although it has a couple outposts in Madison Square Garden. But it was known not just for its overstuffed sandwiches, but also for its surly waiters. And tourists would come, as you see in this photograph, um, they'd go shopping at Macy's and then they'd come uptown to go to Carnegie Delicatessen to have a real taste of New York. And one of the things that's important to note about Ashkenazi food in America is how closely identified it is with New York and New York City and what it means to be um, a, a New Yorker. And it gave a lot of identity to the city. So much so that in 1968, the cover of New York Magazine had this wonderful design by Milton Glaser a Gentile's Guide to Jewish Food. And here you have the iconic bagel and the fish that will soon turn into smoked fish and be seated on that very bagel. So this identification of Jewish food and New York was really strong. And uh, Madison Avenue decided that there was some money that could be made. And they decided to run this ad campaign in beginning in 1964 that was so successful that it went into the early 70s for Levy's Rye Bread, which was a bakery that made a real Jewish rye in Brooklyn. And they wanted to uh, bring it uh, just from its Brooklyn base and let more people know about it. And to do that, they decided to use a number of different faces. There were 10 of, in all of um, not Jewish faces, but uh, the kinds of New Yorkers you might see. And these posters were put up on the New York City subways and people just loved them. You don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's real why. Even Malcolm X really liked this poster and posed in front of it. But the irony of the Levy's rye bread campaign, of course, is that uh, they took this bakery rye, it was packaged, it was wrapped in uh, plastic so that uh, people could buy it in the grocery store. And by promoting this Jewish food that could be sold at groceries, it meant that people were then less likely to go to their neighborhood bakery and that was not a good thing for the actual really good Jewish rye, like you might find at a bakery called Borwashers. So it wasn't just promoting a New York food that was Jewish to a larger audience, but corporate America decided that a Jewish audience would be a very good focus for its products. Remember that uh, samovar that I showed you at the beginning? The Eastern European Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, were great tea drinkers. And Maxwell House Coffee in the 1920s decided that they could also be great coffee drinkers. And so they tried to encourage Jews to drink coffee. Um, and uh, one of the original conversion of the Jews from tea to coffee. In 1932, they hired a man named Joseph Jacobs, who uh, had a Jewish ad agency, and asked him to do a campaign for Maxwell House Coffee. And he had the brilliant idea to uh, do a free giveaway. And of course, everyone loves that. And so he created a Passover Haggadah, which is um, a text that is used for the Passover service that tells the story of the Jews leaving Egypt, um, the exodus from Egypt over 2000 years ago with prayers and with commentary. So for every can of Maxwell House coffee that uh, someone bought, they got a free Haggadah. 
And this Haggadah became so popular that it went through many editions, lots of different covers, and it actually ended up being the standard Haggadah that was used in many middle-class Jewish homes. Um, to date, something like 55 million of these Haggadahs have been printed and they are still being made available. Even before that, Crisco had gotten in on the act. So these days we look down on Crisco, we anathematize it because we want real food. But when it was introduced by Procter and Gamble in 1911, it was, as Rabbi Moses Margoli said in the pamphlet, The Story of Crisco, the Hebrew race has been waiting 4,000 years for Crisco. And why might that be? Well, if you have a meal where you have served meat, you can't serve anything that has dairy in it, as I mentioned earlier. So if you want to bake something that has butter, that cannot be part of the dessert at the meat meal. Enter Crisco. It was made from cottonseed oil and it was hydrogenated, which means that it was made solid at room temperature. And that meant that because it was plant-based, it could be neutral, what's called parve. And it could be served either with meat or with dairy. And uh, it, was, uh, it could be a universal food. And it sort of transformed the Jewish kitchen because people, uh, it was certified kosher, which was very important. It was convenient and it was neutral. And importantly, it was very white. So it seemed as though it was uh, hygienic. And this whole movement in American foods that can be traced from, you know, the hearty, delicious, healthy, whole grain rye bread to Wonder Bread, you know, foods becoming ever whiter and uh, therefore ostensibly better and more pure. Crisco uh, fit the bill on many levels. And in 1932, um, Procter & Gamble published the recipe booklet that you see here, Crisco Recipes for the Jewish Housewife. And very significantly, it was published in, it was printed in both Yiddish and in English, which meant that the old first generation immigrant, the grandmother, who was still reading Yiddish, could work alongside her more modern granddaughter, who would be reading English, and therefore the two could come together through Crisco and make delicious desserts. Well, let's jump a little bit forward to the marvelous Mrs. Maisel and her Coca-Cola brisket. So this is more my era. And when I was growing up um, for Sabbath dinner, we often had my mother's famous sweet and sour meatballs. And she made these sweet and sour meatballs with Welch's Concord grape jelly and chili sauce. And she also added ginger snaps for uh, some spice. And they were really amazing. Mrs. Maisel added Coca-Cola to her brisket. And when I saw this image, it reminded me um, and sent me back to my uh, little recipe clipping notebook, where down here you can see uh, a little piece of paper that must be about 50 years old where I've written perfect Jewish style brisket. And what do you do? You take a, a, a brisket, put it fat side up in a Dutch oven, add a bottle of chili sauce, a can of Coke, and a package of Lipton um, dry onion soup mix, cover it, bake it at 325, 350 for 30 minutes, and it turns out perfect. So in the 1950s, 1960s, convenience foods were really very much the rage. And uh, people were a little concerned about the loss of tradition and so much time spent making a lot of the old foods in the kitchen. But not all of the uh, corporate commercial foods were a bad thing. And the one that arguably changed the American Jewish kitchen most uh, was Philadelphia cream cheese in its original brick form. 
So as I mentioned with the blintzes, um, Eastern European Jews and Central European Jews ate a lot of farmer's cheese, which is a fresh cheese made very easily just by souring milk and uh, letting the curds uh, separate from the whey. But um, in the late 19th century, in New York State, it wasn't a Jewish thing, but um, there were uh, some cheesemakers who decided to add more cream to their cheese and make it creamier in the style of French Neufchatel. It became very popular. And two immigrant brothers from Lithuania, the Breakstone brothers, and you probably know Breakstone products, which are still sold today, they started making a cream cheese. And it was very popular, and they sold it to a company in the 1920s, and that company uh, was very successful, so successful that in 1928, Kraft wanted to buy it. This cheese was called Philadelphia, not because it was made in Philadelphia, but, but just because Philadelphia was known as a dairy center and it was a mark of uh, high quality to have Philadelphia cream cheese. So um, when Kraft took over, they started advertising a lot and trying to get their cheese into American homes. And it was at about this time that this holy trinity of bagels, cream cheese, and lox developed. So it's not a thing of long standing. Uh, the bagel goes back to the early 17th century, probably in Poland. The farmer's cheese was eaten for hundreds of years in the old country. More likely, the Jews were eating pickled herring, which they could afford, that they were eating a fish. They came to this country, they found that salmon was affordable. And lox, which is simply brined salmon, uh, that has been cured with salt was uh, something that they could put on the bagel. And when they put it next to the cream cheese, you can see that in a way it almost looks like meat, you know, red meat with the cheese and this sort of sense of maybe it's a little bit illicit. And the three come together in a very uh, Jewish way the bagel, cream cheese, and lox, which became the classic Sunday morning brunch. The rugelach are also an old world treat. In Germany, they were known as Schnecken or snails um, because of their coiled shape. They were made with yeast and uh, they took quite a while to rise. In Ukraine and in Russia, they were called ragaliki, which means little horns. And that's where the name rogalak comes from, these little horns or crescents. And when you add cream cheese to the butter to make this dough, it becomes really, really tender and wonderfully flaky. And so recipes for this kind of rogalak started appearing around 1950. So again, based on these older Jewish foods, but in a very modern American iteration. What really made American uh, Jewish food go mainstream though was the bagel. In 1963, uh, Lenders Bakery in New Haven, Connecticut installed the first automated bagel machine. And it's significant that it was in New Haven because New York City had a really powerful bagel makers union and they did not want to lose their jobs to automation. But um, these machines could turn out lots and lots of um, bagels really rapidly. Murray Lender, who was the son of the founder of this bagel shop, uh, had the idea to pre-slice them Free, package them, freeze them, or refrigerate them, and get them into supermarkets. And this was sort of the beginning of the end to the great Jewish bagel, which had a very short shelf life, and now it had an endless, nearly endless shelf life, but it meant that it could go mainstream, and pe people could pick up bagels whenever they wanted and people found uh, that they liked bagels and that it was a novelty food. And bagel cafes started opening throughout the United States. Uh, they started making them in many different flavors, which I find personally is an abomination. Um, they're touted as having no cholesterol and low fat. And so with the bagel, 
becoming nearly ubiquitous. Of course, this being America, it had to become something both larger and smaller than itself. Today, you can go online to Gold Belly and order a jumbo, a jumbo bagel from O Bagel in Hoboken, New Jersey, which not only is enormous enough to serve over 12 people, but contains besides the bagel, you have eggs, you have cheese, you have ham, and you have bacon. So it is definite, definitely not kosher, but you do have the everything bagel topping um, which gives it a kind of Jewish tastiness with the caraway seeds, the garlic, and the onion. If something goes jumbo and supersize in the United States, then you can be pretty sure that it will also be miniaturized. And that's where the bagel bites come in. And what I find so fascinating about the bagel bites, which can go right into the microwave, um, these also having cheese and pepperoni, which is uh, made from pork, so it's doubly not kosher. Bagels have been now transformed into pizza. So, I mean, that's, I guess, about as American as you can get. Well, all of those uh, jumbo bagels and uh, bagel bites are what we would consider junk food. And in the 1990s, um, there was a move in the United States, a public health move to get so much fat out of the American diet. There was great concern about trans fats, um, which are in Crisco. And so Crisco has reformulated, so it's still hydrogenated, but not trans fats. But one of the um, sacrifices that many people made was with latkes. Latkes are potato pancakes that are traditionally made at Hanukkah, and they're a very symbolic food. They're really fantastic because they're fried in lots of oil to commemorate the um, rededication of the temple in Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago when they wanted to light the lamp and they only had enough oil for one day, but miraculously, the oil lasted for eight days. So it's this wonderful holiday where you fry food like latkes or sufganiyot, which are uh, jelly-filled donuts. Well, there was a move to make healthy latkes and take them out of the oil and bake them in the oven. But there you have a food that then loses its symbolism. And by the uh, 21st century, there was a great concern in some parts because a lot of these traditional foods really were being lost. Uh, David Sachs wrote this wonderful book that came out in 2009, Save the Deli, uh, not just because you get overstuffed sandwiches there, but also because the deli was really like a secular synagogue for many Jewish families where you could go and schmooze, talk for a long time, uh, commune with one another, and have this kind of third space over food. Uh, as many of the delis were closing, a new kind of deli began opening up throughout the United States. In New York, uh, something like Mile End, which was an import from uh, Montreal. In San Francisco, you have Wise Sons uh, Jewish Delicatessen, and they've just come out with a cookbook uh, just this year. And these new delis uh, didn't really uh, concern themselves with adhering to the laws of kashrut, of being kosher. You can see from their menu, uh, the patty melt has pastrami and ground beef with Jewish rye with Swiss cheese. Many of them played on uh, this Yiddishkeit, this uh, love of Yiddish words. So instead of a Big Mac, uh, a Big Mac like you would have at McDonald's, you have a Big Macher. Macher being the Yiddish word for someone who gets things done and really is kind of a fixer. Um, other forms of honoring Ashkenazi food appeared. In 2012, Jeffrey Yaskowitz and Liz Alpern founded this wonderful company called uh, Gefilteria that um, celebrates 
traditional Ashkenazi food. And they make a really beautiful gefilte fish. If you remember the Manashevitz fish, um, the fish balls that most of us grew up with, they are not the traditional gefilte fish, which uh, gefilte means stuffed. And the original one was a uh, carp where you would uh, take the flesh and the bones out of the fish. You would mix the flesh with uh, breadcrumbs, with eggs, with uh, onions. It was a way of uh, taking fish and making a stuffing, which meant that it could serve more people. You put the stuffing back inside the fish skin, sew it up and bake it. So by making a tureen, it actually recalls uh, more closely the original gefilte fish. And they have a, a cookbook that celebrates these Ashkenazi foods called the Gefilte Manifesto. And lo and behold, in 2014, no less an arbiter of uh, good taste than the New York Times, the Melissa Clark, headlined, Schmaltz finds a new younger audience. Schmaltz being rendered chicken fat, which is the classic Jewish fat for cooking. And here it celebrates um, this wonderful food that is now seen as uh, healthier because it's pure, it's real, it's not artificially made uh, with uh, chemicals the way Frisco is. Schmaltz just doesn't get the respect that it deserves. So I'm coming to the end now and I just wanted to show you uh, this latest iteration of Jewish American food. Pocus opened during the pandemic. Um, if you know Cream Line in um, the Chelsea market, they had to close down because of the pandemic. And so they decided to uh, create this Jewish style barbecue that they named Pocus, which is a Yiddish word for drumsticks but also for those you know, wonderfully fat little baby thighs. And it's takeout um, only, although they are hoping to open uh, an actual cafe in DeKalb Market um, not too long from now. But like uh, we saw with the other dog, they played with, um, they play with English phrases. So instead of about us, you have the spiel the story. You have the schmooze letter instead of the newsletter. You have tchotchkes, which is the merchandise, the branded merchandise. They make a pretty awesome brisket that they serve with horseradish sauce. They make a pimento cheese that has uh, everything bagel spice. They serve matzo chips instead of potato chips. So it's this wonderful mix of a uh, very Jewish food but also very American food. And it shows the ways in which Jewish food, Ashkenazi food moved into the mainstream and is now unbelievably trendy. Um, and they were just written up in the New Yorker as a matter of fact, but also how American food came into the Jewish kitchen. So I will end with this slide because what is iconic of all when we talk about Ashkenazi food? Well, it has to be Jewish penicillin. Jewish penicillin being none other than chicken soup. And everyone wishes for a Jewish mother, someone who is eternally loving, who is wise, who maybe is a little bit guilt-inducing at times, maybe a little bit intrusive, but always there for you and always there to make you feel better. And this idea of chicken soup for the soul um, is so entrenched in American popular culture that a whole uh, empire has been built out of the branded chicken soup for the soul books, which have, I think, 80 different titles, chicken soup for the teenage soul, for the grandmotherly soul, for the Girl Scout soul. And now you have, can have chicken soup for the soul for your dogs and cats as well so that they can be as happy as the rest of us. So I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm happy to answer questions now. Um, if, uh, Catherine, can you? Sorry, just needed to unmute. Um, 
Um, what we do, what we'll do for questions is ask you please to write them into the chat at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I will uh, read them to Dara Goldstein and um, we can see, see where we go. So the chat is open as far as I know. Um, and we're waiting. But maybe I'll prime the pump a little bit. Um, thank you, Dara, for I wish, I wish we could applaud um, in real life. Um, I, see, I see some applause um, on the screen in the postage stamps that everyone is scrunched into. Um, this, was, this was really enlightening. And I'm still trying to wrap my mind around chicken soup for the, um, for the dog, for the, for the for the dog and cat soul. Um, Jewish motherhood, I guess, goes in all sorts of directions. Um, I have a question, but let me ask the very pragmatic question that somebody has just posed. Uh, will this recording be available to listen to at a later time? And if so, where and when? Um, Chrissy, would you like to respond? Chrissy Walsh? I actually don't know where, but I'm assuming it will be on the Jewish Studies webpage, or at least a link will be on the Jewish Studies webpage. Yes. Um, okay. okay. And the Jewish Studies webpage is the Jewish Studies program at the University of Pennsylvania. You, you can, um, you can Google, it, Google it or search for it, and uh, you'll end up on the webpage, and uh, we will place it in as prominent a uh, spot as we can. It'll probably be linked to the event uh, under the title events, but uh, we will try to, perhaps once we get it up, we, since we have your email addresses, we will try to email you the link or email you the where to find the link. Um, okay. Um, there's another question, which is, Dara Goldstein commented that Crisco transformed the Jewish kitchen referring to uh, hydrogenated solid fat. Did the liquid Crisco cooking oil, oh boy, everything's popping down so fast. Um, corn oil, for example, have a similar transformative effect earlier vis-a-vis -vis chicken fat or other fats. And also, what do you see the future of Ashkenazi Jewish food in America given the trendiness of Sephardic and Mizrahi food today in Israel and in the US with places, with restaurants like Zahav in Philadelphia? Okay, that's two very different questions. Um, I think the important thing about the solid Crisco is that it is really good for baking. Uh, you can make very flaky pie crust with it, for example, and you can't use liquid. Uh, corn oil. I grew up with Mazzola corn oil. We didn't use Crisco corn oil, but um, the the Crisco for baking was what was so transformative. So yes, there were um, vegetable oils that could be used for cooking, but it didn't allow you to make a, a pie crust or a, a cake for dessert. Um, as for the trendiness of um, Sephardic uh, Israeli cooking, which is really what is so trendy now. I mean, it's everywhere. And it is uh, sort of the culinary darling of the moment. And uh, there's a reason for that because it um, is closer to what, you know, we have been told is the healthy Mediterranean diet. And uh, it also has really beautiful flavors, but it doesn't have that soulful soulfulness that the Ashkenazi food has. And so what we're seeing among um, the hipster population is this revival of older Ashkenazi foods, things like knishes, which um, are basically like pirashki, sort of heavy ones, but they're uh, little uh, pie-shaped things that are baked that are filled with potatoes or filled with uh, kasha with buckwheat growths. And the idea of a starch filled with another starch, you know, it's very far from, say, the Israeli salad with uh, cucumbers and tomatoes and things like that, but it's really satisfying. So I think that um, the future of Ashkenazi food at the moment is uh, looking pretty good. 
Another question is, uh, were there conflicts between Reform and Orthodox Jews? Of course there were. And did those conflicts play out in any way in food communities? Yes, uh, Orthodox Jews keep kosher and keep strictly kosher and uh, basically don't eat at the same table with uh, Jews who have not uh, prepared food in a kosher kitchen. And um, let's see, um, a comment said uh, that kvass was originally a non-alcoholic drink unless in the United States Jews made adaptations and made it alcoholic. It, it's very likely alcoholic. Um, whenever you ferment something, you get a little bit of alcohol uh, when you make the beverage. So the traditional class is only about 2%. It's not going to make you drunk. Um, it's not even as alcoholic as beer, but it does have a little bit. Um, the kind of bottle class that you might find in some of the Russian grocery stores is really more like soda today, but the original stuff um, has this bit of uh, fermentation. Oh, a little tingle to it. Um, and another questioner asks, is there a comprehensive book covering the history of Jewish cooking in the United States and or beyond with recipes? Oh, with recipes? There is a book by a man named John Cooper called Eat and Be Satisfied. And it's a, a history of um, Jewish food. The problem is that it's not written in a lively manner. It's a little bit, um, not fun to read, even though it has a lot of information. Um, Arthur Schwartz has a wonderful cookbook called, um, what is it called? Um, the Yiddish, Yiddish cooking or Jewish cooking? Um, I'll have to look it up. I can, uh, his name is Arthur Schwartz. And it's all of these Ashkenazi foods. That one came out about uh, 10 years ago. The Gefilte Manifesto in its headnotes has a little bit of history. Uh, Joe Nathan's Jewish Cooking in America has a lot of history in it. So I would urge you to look at that one, but there isn't the, you know, uh, magnum opus yet. It still remains to be written. Work for the future. Another question, a wonderful question asks, um, you started your talk uh, with um, with the late 19th century, later 19th century, but what about the genealogy of Jewish food in the United States in the earlier 19th century and even the 18th century? And could you also think of, ta tell, this is the second question, could you also say something about regional specificities like matzo ball gumbo? Okay, really good questions. The reason I started with the mid 19th century was very strategic. And that is because the title of this talk is The Ashkenazi Kitchen in America. And the first Jews to come to the United States um, in the 17th century were Sephardic Jews. And uh, they brought Sephardic ways with them. So um, even though there were smaller migrations, it wasn't until it was the uh, massive migration of the 19th century that this Jewish food began to have a uh, resonance in the United States. Um, I didn't, uh, you know, talks like this, you uh, don't have much time for nuance. I talked about Ashkenazi food. Well, uh, there is a lot of, uh, there are battles that are fought uh, among the different branches of Ashkenazi, depending where you grew up. I mean, if you grew up in Poland and you like your food sweet and sour, if you grew up in Lithuania, then you tend to not want to add that sweetness and you like a lot of pepper. So there are a lot of regional differences for how uh, uh, basic foods are prepared and what they taste like. As for matzo ball gumbo, it's uh, the name of Marcy Goldman's book. Um, and it's a really wonderful book, which uh, looks at uh, the history of Jews in the South and uh, through their food ways. And again, it's this process of give and take, um, of adaptation and of sharing 
what I find so distinctive in the New York uh, centered um, focus of this talk is that uh, corporate America became very closely involved as opposed to just home cooks sharing their food base. Wonderful. Um, a question that popped into my mind as well, but somebody else asked this is, um, information on the Jewish relationship to Chinese food. There's oh. been some really wonderful pieces written about that, I know. So um, Jews and Chinese food, um, a wonderful topic for another talk. But basically, uh, Jews on uh, Christmas Day, uh, many Jews have a tradition of going to Chinese restaurants. Because on Christmas, uh, restaurants in general are are closed because people are celebrating at home with their families, but Chinese restaurants stay open. So it became this thing that you could always go to a Chinese restaurant. But there's also something, um, one of the things I didn't talk about in terms of kashrut, um, most of these non-kosher cookbooks in the 19th century and continuing into the 20th century allow for shellfish. Pork is, um, more trafe, if it's possible to say that, it is more repugnant. Um, and uh, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, a lot of the foods, uh, even if there is pork, it doesn't look like pork. You know, it's cut up in very small pieces. So you don't have a, a hunk of ham or you don't have a piece of bacon or anything that really looks like pork. So in a way for uh, Jews who are not kosher, uh, it seemed like an easy way to um, eat uh, in an American uh, non-Jewish setting. But I have to say that a lot of uh, Chinese restaurants then became kosher so that they could attract a kosher Jewish clientele. And there's a kosher uh, Chinese cookbook. And so there is some cross fertilization there too. And Philly has uh, a couple of vegetarian kosher Chinese restaurants that uh, Jewish Studies at Penn likes to frequent periodically. Um, somebody asks, is, is, did the concept of it's not tr trafe if, if it's healthy and pure grow legs beyond the popularity of the cookbook you mentioned? Not oh, sure no. Right. no. And um, that's cookbook said that the definition of trafe was that it uh, was clean and healthy. Uh, you know, it had nothing to do with whether it was pork or, or shellfish. So, uh, no. Okay. Um, Erica Ginsburg said, my grandfather and father worked at Vita Foods in Philadelphia, mid 20th century, Lox, Nova, Sable, Sturgeon, Pickles. Before that, early 20th century, Grandpop had his own fish company, Belofsky and Granoff. Before that, Grandpop's family business was fish back in Russia. I might ask a question here. Did, the, did some of the, um, the famous uh, Jewish food purveyors that you mentioned have food uh, careers in the old country or in their lineage? Uh, you know, it's a really interesting question. What is the of that, um, the pickle, pickle man, the movie, yeah. that what is it? Oh, I haven't seen it yet. I don't know, but I know the movie, yeah. It's about a, a pickle maker who comes to this country, you know, and, and tries to make pickles. Um, I, I'm not sure that that was true of most of them. Most of them came to this country with a very few skills and had to quickly make a life for themselves. And so food and selling food was one way that they could do that. Of course, there were some who brought, uh, you know, uh, skills from the old country, but no, it was mostly a new world thing. Somebody else writes, um, great program. Now I'm really hungry. Where is Pulkis located in New York? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think you've already made a sale for them. <laughs> market. Uh, you can go online, order online, and uh, pick it up. And also have delivery within, I'm obviously way too far from them, so I haven't looked at the delivery options. Um, Ashkenazi food gets a bad rap for being unhealthy. Are there any healthier dishes you think might be prime for a comeback? Oh, 
Oh, well, I mean, if you look at uh, kasha, for instance, one of my favorite foods in the world, it's buckwheat groats. It's, um, buckwheat is actually a grass. Um, it doesn't have gluten. Uh, it has this really nutty flavor. Uh, you uh, cook it like you do rice, although I like to put it into the oven so it doesn't get sticky. Uh, you can add uh, mushrooms that you saute. You can saute onions and add it. You can add dill. Um, that is about, a, a plateful of that is about as healthy as you can get. Also a, a, a bowl of chicken soup um, and maybe with a matzo ball in it. Uh, there are a lot of um, farmer's cheese in and of itself um, turned into a salad with uh, chopped cucumbers, um, again dill, which is a very Ashkenazi uh, uh, herb. Um, yes, it's not all uh, cholesterol laden. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> dishes are. Um, how about kosher tacos? This is a, an American phenomenon, making non-kosher uh, dishes from other cultures kosher. Yes, so there's a new book, a new cookbook that just came out um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, called Modern Kosher. And it is mm -hmm. by, um, sorry, Michael somebody, uh, who lives in San Diego. And he has a section in the beginning uh, that is uh, traditional Jewish foods, but then he moves into foods from all over the world. Uh, so uh, there's Mexican cuisine, there is Italian, there's French, there's uh, Spanish, there is uh, Asian of various different stripes. So yes, um, as long as you adhere to the rules of kashrut, you can eat in a kosher way and it doesn't have to be a uh, food that is kind of marked as intrinsically Jewish. Right. Um, the origin of knedlech. My, um, my understandings, ask the questioner, Adam, is that commercially packed matzo meal is a recent American invention. What did matzo balls look and taste like in the old countries? <laughs> I wasn't alive, so I can't, and you know, there weren't any photographs. <laughs> so uh, you, there was definitely matzah, and um, you uh, had to uh, grind things very laboriously. Uh, you had chicken fat, you always had chicken fat. Um, you always had onions, even if you were very poor you had water, you could put them all together. Um, I have a feeling that the matzo balls in the old country were definitely sinkers and not floaters. Um, there was no adding of a little bit of uh, Perrier or carbonated water or club soda or anything to lighten them. But um, I don't know, I, I, that has to live in my imagination. There's in Pauline Vengeroff's memoir, Memoirs of a Grandmother, translated by um, Shulamit Magnus, um, there's an incredible long chapter, which is fantastic, about preparing for Passover, making the matzah, and then making matzah meal out of matzahs. And, and also, I think there's a couple of paragraphs about making matzah balls. Uh, so anyone who wants to read a literary account uh, which connects to what you do, Dara, which is literature and food. I will, so you'll have to send me that. Um, okay, I will. Um, Delancey Street, is that the movie you were thinking of? No. American Pickle. Thank you. Yeah. For adding that. Right. American Pickle. Okay. Um, I think, uh, let's see. I think I think I saw that I had 17 more. Oh, uh, Chava Weisler tells us that Bella Chagall also describes the making of matzah meal and farfel by pounding matzah. And, and there is an English translation of her memoir as well. Um, uh, nye fat is a substitute for chicken fat. Was that vegetarian? I don't know nye fat. I'm sorry. Nye fat. 
doesn't appeal to me. I, Crisco sounds better, although <laughs> long in the past. All right. Well, and um, I was I was just going to ask if there aren't more questions. I was going to ask um, were there what Russian dishes, not Russian Jewish dishes, but what Russian foods or elements did not make it to America in Ashkenazi cooking? Oh, well, um, I'm not going to answer that directly because it makes me think of something that I would like to say that actually should have been in the talk and I <laughs> didn't put it in, but this jogs my memory. So one of the foods that uh, is very much associated with uh, Jewish cooking is borscht. And uh, people think of that as a Jewish soup. And in many ways it is, but uh, it is made by Russians. It's actually originally Ukrainian. So the Ukrainians can claim it as their nat national soup, whereas for Russia, it's uh, cabbage soup which um, I think didn't really come across the ocean. You have something like shav, which is sorrel soup, which definitely came across. Uh, cabbage soup is not beloved, I would say, in, in Ashkenazi cooking. But the interesting thing about borscht is that it became um, another iconic food that you could get at these, uh, if it was made with meat, obviously you couldn't get the dairy restaurant, but you could get a vegetarian version. But the uh, wonderful Jewish and uh, also Russian version is made with something called Russell. And the word Russell um, is simply uh, the Yiddish name for Russell, which is the Russian word for brine. So you make a beet kvass. Again, you take beets and you cut them up and you put them in water and you let them ferment for a couple of weeks and you get this gorgeous garnet liquid that has this beautiful sour tang and if you use that as the basis for your borscht then it's just fantastic and i have a recipe for that in my cookbook um which so, which cookbook in the beyond the north wind my recipe. Oh, okay okay the most recent cookbook okay the new one um in fact uh somebody in my neighborhood in northwest philadelphia is uh selling uh beet kvass uh for uh, um, for soup making, oh. so I have a jar in my fridge. Wonderful. So um, beet cross, most people aren't using it to make borscht. They're using it to drink because uh, it, again, is very trendy because of the probiotics that you get from fermenting the beets. So that is uh, something that came across the ocean. Wonderful. All right. I think that. Um, I think that you have whetted our appetites for um, for dinner, if those of those of us who haven't had dinner yet, and uh, for reading further and cooking more adventurously and appreciating the history of what we um, eat and um, and read about and uh, enjoy. And thank you so much for this fabulous talk. And um, if everybody wants to make a gesture of applause, even if you can't be heard. We, we really appreciate your coming. Thank you. Oh, there is a raised hand. Um, Susan, I don't know what your raised hand is. I can't see you either. Speak up or on chat if you want. Anyway, thank you very, very much. And thank, you. So, thank you for joining me. Um, it's wonderful to see. Well, I haven't really seen so many faces, but I know that you're there. <laughs> okay. Um, and there's oh, there's a well, there's a final. We'll say, we'll try to save the chat and share it with you. There's a final long comment, which is lovely, <laughs> as well. I actually haven't seen all the comments. I was focusing. You you can't. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Dara, hang around for a minute.